Once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned upward. For there you have been, and there you will always long to return. That from Leonardo da Vinci. After spending 13 hours at the Rome airport, trying to rebook a canceled flight. I'm Larry Fedoruk, and this is my weekly podcast, Later That Same Life. On each episode, a topic, discussion, or story from our lives. Season 7, Chapter 11. The Miracle of Flight. I'm sure many of us will have fond memories of this past holiday season. But sadly, many will remember this Christmas and New Year's as an air travel nightmare. The miracle of flight, grounded not only by Mother Nature, but by human incompetence. And this came on the heels of disastrous summer air travel problems. Seems like the only time the airlines and the airports have issues is when people want to travel. March break, summer vacation, Christmas, New Year's. As long as people stay home, airlines and airports can run efficiently. In the U.S., American Airlines, Delta, Frontier, almost all of the airlines had to cancel flights. However, the inefficiency award goes to Southwest, who canceled over 15,000 flights over the break, around 3,000 on Christmas Day alone. In Canada, Sunwing was the high-profile culprit, delaying hundreds of frozen Canadians who were just longing to get to a beach vacation. Many of those who did make it to somewhere warm got stuck there with no way home. Ah yes, poor them, stuck in a tropical climate, forced to exist on rum punch. But yeah, you know, they couldn't get home to jobs and They were out of pocket even further for hotel rooms, meals, et al. In almost every case, the stories were the same. No one from the airline to help us. No one to tell us what was going on. Virtually nothing on the website. Waiting on hold on the toll-free number for like eight hours before being hung up on. Brutal. Also, in so many cases, the passenger's luggage probably had a better trip than they did. Scenes at airports showed what seemed like vast acres of bags and suitcases. Not sure where they were even supposed to be, but certainly not there, sitting on a vast expanse at an airport. Possibly they were in the right city, maybe not. All of those bags, many containing necessary medication or Christmas gifts for loved ones, just sitting there. One woman who spoke to media had her own GPS tracker on her bag. Her phone app was telling her her suitcase was in Montreal, inexplicably, but the airline could actually not confirm the same information, nor how the bag got there, or when it might be returned to her. The rest of the airport filled with passengers, canceled, delayed, bumped, Ignored, tired, grumpy, sitting, sleeping, waiting, wherever they could find a free space. The only reason it didn't get even more out of hand, in my opinion, was that it was the airport. Americans were less likely to have firearms on them at the airport. Otherwise, don't you think there would have been gunfights over who had squatting rights over this little corner of the carpeting? Air travel and lost luggage are such a cliché. Now there's an entire business model built around shipping your luggage to your destination separately. You may have seen the ads on TV. Sounds good, except that this can add several hundred dollars to your already expensive trip. And that luggage shipped, uh, you know, also has to go by plane. Not the one you're on, but some plane. And if the planes aren't flying, all that money spent for nothing. Or else your luggage arrives at your destination, but your plane does not. Ship your luggage ahead of time. Yeah, it's only a plan when it works. For their part, the two biggest sinners of this past season, Sunwing and Southwest, 
both apologized. Hey, we said we're sorry. Well, you're sorry doesn't cut it, mister. Southwest and the state said that the affected passengers will get their money back. Eventually. Also, money back for expenses incurred as a result of their mismanagement. Eventually. And oh yeah, your luggage. Yeah, yeah, that'll get returned, we hope. Eventually. So not only was I canceled, delayed, lost, and I missed the holidays, but now I gotta spend a number of hours online filling out forms. So of course there's a class action lawsuit already being mounted. And this is Rich. Southwest tried to sweeten the deal by saying they'll also offer free air miles to disrupted customers. I don't get the logic of that. I had such a bad experience with your product or service, so your solution is to offer me coupons to use it again? It's like, sorry our hamburger tasted like sawdust. How about the next one is on the house? So, airlines and airports. Just not set up to effectively deal with A, a lot of customers, and B, challenges that may come up on the side. But there is also a third finger of blame that I point at this nightmare before Christmas and uh, during and after. That is the air travelers. Yes, the passengers, the customer. If TV news never shows me another whining, bitching airline passenger, I'll be good with that. First of all, you, me, whomever, Yes, we pay our good money for a service. We enter into a contract. I will give you money. You provide this. If you don't, we have a problem. You have the right to demand answers, to get your money back, and to even be put out in the process. But hey, air travelers, you have come to take this service for granted. This is the reason I called this podcast the miracle of flight. We underappreciate what it takes to get all this done. Like every other instant tap, click thing that we do. If it's not happening, we're quickly inconsolable. Excuse me, I ordered the side salad. I've been waiting for over eight minutes. This is air travel. The miracle of flight. People no longer appreciate what it takes to get 300 people and their belongings 30,000 feet into the air travel at the speed of sound, and land safely somewhere else. Rather than appreciate the miracle, flyers mostly complain about the food, crying babies, and, uh, you know, the wine was a little too fruity. Granted, airlines have willingly entered into trying to execute this entire endeavor, and largely they do a pretty poor job of it. But air passengers, you decided to travel at the busiest time of year, when weather is at its most volatile. I mean, even the meteorologist told you, hey, there's a storm coming. But you went to the airport anyway, largely unprepared for long delays. And then you begin to whine to the first lazy news reporter who sticks a camera and a microphone in your face. Air passengers expect too much, especially if you consider the way airlines have performed in the past. Airlines have outdated systems, and they have lousy customer service. Airports are only designed for travelers, not stayers. Combine all of that and there you have it, a large refugee camp of holiday migrants. Grumpy people at an airport trying to book train tickets or rent a car. Planes, trains, and automobiles? A very funny movie, but only when you're watching it not when it's actually happening to you. We'd have more luck playing pickup sticks with our butt cheeks than we will get the flat out of here before daybreak. This is what I mean. We've got to get a hold of ourselves. Flight is a miracle. And I use miracle as a descriptor. I get that it's science and technology. But we should really reassess how we think about flight and air travel. Firstly, do you know how long humankind has had flight? Only about a century. Well, 120 years now, but only that long. The Wright brothers, credited with the invention. I know, Da Vinci had some sketches before then, and there was, uh, you know, hot air balloons, 
and being fired out of a cannon, but I'm not counting those. Those are technically flying. You've taken to the sky. But when it comes to air travel, flying was not the only big problem that had to be solved. There was even a bigger one. It was called landing, safe landing. And you had to think of it beforehand. You know, once we're up, you couldn't go, oh, geez, uh, how are we going to get down? The Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, succeeded in both. The first controlled flight and landing of a heavier-than-air machine. Just a few feet off the ground for 59 seconds, and they traveled 852 feet. That's about the length of an average city street. Basically, they flew down the block, and that was considered an extraordinary achievement. And you know when that was? December 17th, 1903. That's it, really not that long ago. It was actually Wilbur that flew the plane, and when he landed 59 seconds later, he discovered that Orville had lost Wilbur's suitcase. And with that, modern aviation was born. 1903, the miracle of flight. They flew for a block. And a little over 65 years later, we flew to the moon and back. I've always thought that to be miraculous. I mean, there's very few inventions or events that have had such an amazing shift. Even more amazing to me that in 1903, Orville and Wilbur glue together some uh, cheap cloth and sticks, strap it to an engine, put it on some bicycle tires, and they fly. 1903. And in under 15 years, there was World War I. And what was famous about World War I? The Flying Aces. Man had barely been flying for a few years, and suddenly these guys were taking airplanes into dives and spins and dead drops, all while shooting machine guns at other planes. This must have been mind-blowing to someone who was alive in the day. Wow, we live in the future. What's next? My former father-in-law was in his 90s when he passed, and it was in the 1990s. So I would always say to him, you know, as a boy, you probably saw the headlines in the papers when the Wright brothers first flew. And then before you know it, you're sitting in a living room watching the moon landing on TV. Aren't you just amazed? And yes, he was. And really, since about World War I, everything else about aviation has been uh, nuance. What I mean is, you know, there's different propulsions and uh, better science and design. But the basic principles that took Wilbur from here to there, basically that's still how we fly. It's a miracle. It's always been interesting to me that the first big leap in airplane technology came as a result of war. Interesting, but not surprising. That's how our society works. There is not one invention or idea where someone in a uniform isn't sitting there saying, hmm, what are the military implications and applications for this? That's their job. It's like the story I told here a couple of weeks ago about the guy who invented ammonium nitrate. Hey, look at this. We can use this to grow enough food to feed the world. Yeah, I know, but you know what else? It blows up real good. We could also use it to kill people. Mmm, gotcha. Good idea. The military application for flight was probably uh, pretty obvious. Hey, we can shoot people from the sky and drop bombs on them. All right, load up. In between wars, flight took a more practical role. Transport. Mostly for the elite, right? You've seen the old pictures and movies where people are flying in an airplane. Men wore suits and ties. Ladies wore hats and white gloves. It was cutlery and linen, curtains. It was like being in your living room, only thousands of feet in the air. And at the same time that military was trying to figure out the applications of flight, there were men in suits who were trying to figure out how to make money from this. Certainly, it was obvious that the elite would pay money for this convenience. But what about everybody else? How do we make it more affordable for everyone else? Well, bigger planes. Let's cut back on the curtains and the cutlery and the linen. Throw in more seats. And before you know it, it became more like taking the bus. And really, that's where we are today. And we've come to take it for granted. 
We think it's just another bus ride to see Aunt Myrna in Edmonton for Christmas or Cousin Eddie in Nevada. It's not. It's the miracle of flight. Here's a quick aviation story that I've always found fascinating and it may be relevant here. In 1935, the U.S. Army Air Corps, there was no Air Force yet, it was called the U.S. Army Air Corps, put out tenders to award a contract for the next long-range bomber. There was no war in 1935, but, uh, you know, got to have one just in case. Who knows when we might need a long-range bomber. In the running to build prototypes were Douglas, Martin, and Boeing. Officers and officials gathered at the Wright Airfield in Ohio, and the Douglas prototype was unveiled. Hmm, looks good. So does the Martin. Then, then, Boeing unveils the Model 299. It was the biggest aircraft anyone had ever seen. They went way beyond the recommended specs. Douglas and Martin looked at each other and said, Hey man, I guess we just lost the contract. Not only was this plane bigger and shinier, it had more engines. It could haul a bigger payload, travel greater distances. Boeing was a shoe in to get this lucrative government contract. Well, it's a formality, but uh, why don't you take it up for a spin? Boeing had hired the best test pilot in America and the second best to be his co-pilot. A total crew of five taxied this beast down the runway. They revved it up. They had lift. About 300 feet up, and it went to bank slightly to the left. It stalled. Crashed. Everyone on board killed. The magnificent machine was deemed too big and too complex to fly. A sad and terrible day, and Boeing lost the contract. A resulting investigation revealed the cause of the crash to be pilot error. The pilot, with all of his experience, had taken up a new, more complex machine and forgot to flip one switch, which would have avoided the stall and the crash. Dedicated engineers at Boeing believed they did have the better plane, so they went back to the office. Eventually, they came up with the checklist. The checklist an invention that came out of aviation. Operation of airplanes was becoming too complicated to be left to a pilot's memory. The checklist came into existence. We've seen or heard this, right? Gauges, check. Flaps, check. Fuel, check. A listed series of duties that have to be executed before and during taxi and takeoff and checked with another against the list. The checklist. Boeing eventually got that contract. The Model 299 became the long-range B-17. It bombed most of Nazi Germany into surrender. Today, checklists are used in countless endeavors. At home, on the job, we know that air crew still use the checklist system. But maybe the airlines themselves should start using one. Or, or maybe we should just bubble wrap ourselves and uh, ship ourselves via Amazon. While thousands of people were stuck at the airport, I was still getting packages at home. Maybe all air travel should be run by governments, you know, like a transit system in a city. It wouldn't be uh, luxurious, but maybe more functional. I mean, come on, private industry has made a mess of it. We do have these passengers' rights bills that allegedly protect us when we travel. Like we needed extra laws to tell the airlines to hold up to their end of the bargain. Give me my money back. Airlines are highly incompetent. Check. Airports are largely dysfunctional. Check. Bad weather shuts the world down. Check. Passenger Wilbur Wright, please report to the desk. Flight number one to the other end of the field has been canceled due to bad weather at the other end of the field. When it comes to air travel, people should lower their expectations. 
check. Flight itself. A miracle. And now, about a century later, flying? Arriving on time with your luggage? Also, a miracle. Later That Same Life is written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedoric. LarryFedoric37 at gmail.com. Subscribe to Larry's podcast YouTube channel. Get automatic notifications with each new episode. 